This washer is on its last legs, and tomorrow we'll get a new one. But before that, I'm going to save the motor. The motor is on this sliding assembly for tensioning it, and that needs to come off. As top loading washer motors go, this is pretty nice. Uh, it's a typical 1750 RPM, 60 Hertz, half horsepower motor. And it's got a set screw mounted pulley on a half inch shaft. Quite often the pulley is welded on. And having extracted it from the washer myself, I know a bit about this motor, but let's assume I know nothing about this motor. So I'll just pull all the wiring off so I can start from scratch. Now we're down to five random wires coming out of it. What do they all do? To figure this out, it helps to know how a motor like this actually works. So you have a magnetically permeable stator made out of iron. That's this part here, and it's got windings on it, which I've simplified by just having one piece that it goes around. And so we have the main winding here in red that makes the magnetic field go up and down like this and a starter winding at a right angle to it that makes the magnetic field go this way. So if we just engage the main winding with AC that makes the magnetic field go up and down, up and down, up and down, which doesn't really give the motor a sense of rotation. So we use a starter winding which will be slightly out of phase that goes side to side and that gives the motor sort of a sense of rotation to get it started. Now typically we draw this even more simplified so here's a diagram for a capacitor start induction motor and we have the main winding which gets connected to 120 volt AC power and the start winding which is connected in series with a switch and a capacitor and that phase shifts the starting winding just enough so that this motor gets a sense of rotation and gets it spinning. But those capacitors cost money and they can fail so in half horsepower washing machine motors they go even simpler. So instead of having a capacitor, they replace that essentially with a resistor and that would be a resistance start induction motor. And because this inductive winding has a resistor in series with it, and this one does not, that one will be ahead slightly in phase from this one, which again gives it the sense of rotation. But this resistor also costs money, so to get rid of that and just make this winding of really, really thin wire so that it has more resistance, so essentially this resistor is built into this winding. So that doesn't just eliminate the resistor, it also means the starter winding is made out of thinner wire, which means it costs less money. And looking at the motor, this is the main winding made out of pretty thick wire. And then just in those three sleeves here, we can see part of the starter winding, which is basically behind the main winding. And that uses much thinner wires. You can barely see them from the camera here. Now let's start probing the resistances between each pair of wires. So I got my connections crisscrossing here just the way I drew it. So rearranging this, we have blue and yellow pretty much connected together. I had 0 0.2 ohms between them, but that's what this meter reads when it's a dead short. And then red and black are connected together at 3.3 ohms. So that's the high resistance winding and this is a lower resistance winding. So I know this is the starter winding, this is the main winding, and somehow blue and yellow connect to the same thing. But looking at the motor, this blue wire actually goes to this little black box here connects to another blue wire here that comes out here and goes down this hole into the winding which is also where the yellow wire goes. Now I know that this is going to be the overcurrent protection because these things always have that sort of thing. So that tells me basically we have the overprotection circuitry right here and yellow brings that out and then it goes on to the winding. So for starters, I'll connect power to here and here, which runs it through the winding and also through the overcurrent protection. And I got the motor clamped to a board because sometimes when they start, they jump a little bit. And if I plug that in, it just hums because it has no sense of rotation. But if I plug it in and give it a kick, then it runs and it can go either way because it has no sense of which way to go. So now I'll also connect the starter winding and I'll just connect it in parallel to the main winding because remember this has got the resistor built in so it'll be slightly out of phase from this one. And on this motor that's connecting yellow to red and white to black. 
So that runs, but rather inelegantly, because that starter winding is not meant to be left on. And that's clockwise. Now let's reverse the polarity of the starter winding, which is red and black. So I'll just switch those two clips around. And now it goes counterclockwise. Now we should disconnect that starter winding as soon as the motor gets up to speed. And that's what this centrifugally activated switch is for, which basically gets activated from this little lever here, which goes to a centrifugal arrangement down here. So once it's up to speed, this thing moves. Now I can also activate this centrifugal switch just with a screwdriver in here. So if I push that, that tab moves away. And now I just got to figure out what connection in the switch disengages when I move this like that. So these things are double tabs, basically just the same connection here. And the only thing that connects anything else on here beyond that is this to this. So sticking the probes on here, we're reading 0 0.2 ohms, which is basically dead short. And if I hit that centrifugal switch now, that opens up. So we need to connect the starter winding through these two here. But before I do that, uh, let's just measure the current. This is set to amperes with the starter winding left on. 25 amperes. So remember the starter winding is red and black. So I'll just take this red wire, connect it to one side of the switch and connect this clip lead to the other side of the switch. So now we have the switch and then the starter winding going to here and to the yellow, which is essentially the common after thermal protection. Much better now. And I'm not afraid to leave it running and the current draw is 5.7 amperes. And that centrifugal switch is now disengaged and if I stop the motor, there, it re-engages for the next startup. And these things here, they're just for connecting things together. So instead of using this clip lead here, I can just plug the uh, black and the yellow on here. So now I'm using the terminal blocks instead of my clip leads, plus the power clip leads, of course. And the motor is pretty much ready to use for whatever. But why did this motor have five wires coming off of it before, whereas I only need the two power leads? Well, the thing is, the timer in this washer could reverse the motor for the spin cycle and the wash cycle. Whereas if I want to reverse it, I need to switch the uh, red and black wires at the motor. So essentially to bring those out to the timer requires more wires. So this was an old 1980s style Maytag washer and there's really not much to it which is why those things were so reliable. Basically, the motor spinning in one direction would uh, run the pump to pump out the water and spin the drum, and this funny gearbox thing in the other direction kind of does that wah 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 thing, and the pump running in the reverse direction wouldn't pump. So that's basically all the action that it could do, plus of course let in hot and cold water. And we had a guy servicing it four years ago, and he made it work better, but he said basically the bearing in here is worn out, and you can't get replacement parts for this anymore. And it's gotten to the point where it just makes horrible noises when it tries to spin sometimes. And the brains of this washer are also super simple, so here we have the level and temperature, and the level switch, basically these four things say how hard this uh, pressure sensor needs to get pressure from the bottom of the tub before it says it's full. And this just controls which of the solenoids turn on, hot, cold, or both. And this is a timer that basically all it does is turn on, let water in, and turn on the motor in either direction. Real simple. Wiring out, and things that make this oil style, uh, look at that, made in USA. And look at that, it comes with a schematic. And here's the schematic. Uh, this is the motor here. Interestingly enough, for some models it does have a starting capacitor. And these switches are actually supposed to be in the timer. That controls the reverse direction and all that. Really not very much to it. It even shows all the different cycles that the timer can do. And ironically, you know, regular and permanent press are almost exactly the same. And here's the new appliances doing their first loads. Uh, 
I'm sure to do a better job, but will this still work in 30 years' time? Pretty unlikely.